Hi my loves, my name's Anna, welcome to my channel, or welcome back, ah! welcome to my channel, or welcome back to my channel, um, on my channel I do therapy sessions where I just do my makeup and I chit chat with you guys about, uh, like my life and random, just whatever, literally whatever comes across my brain. But, um, yeah, so this is part two of Richard Ramirez, like I said in the first part. I know he's got a series on Netflix right now, but I have already done the notes and everything for this. I had planned on doing it, but, um, yeah, and I'm just, I'm still going to do it. So, where we left off is I was telling you guys about how the media were getting a hold more of the story and the media is going to play a majorly terrible role in this whole investigation but we will get more into that later on so well over 200 police forgive me if i'm looking down and stuff glancing down this is a lot of notes there's a lot of names and stuff so there has to be notes and it's low-key impossible to remember every single name and every single little detail but anyways so yeah the cats again, y'all. These cats. One's Jackie, one's Mojo. I'm not actually I'm not gonna name all of them. Anyways, so um, just I wanted to give my normal disclaimer. There are gonna be descriptions of crime scenes. We are gonna be talking about children, and there will be adult dialogue. So I just wanted to give that fair warning. If you did not want to watch that, then yeah, I wanted to save you from that. So I'm very like close, like. Hello. <laughs> Anyways, that was weird. I'm, I'm really weird. Anyways, so, like I said, well over 200 police had officially gotten involved in this case. They split them up kind of in, like, divisions. Like, one were literally, like, investigating the shoes. And then investigating where the tire iron was from, where it was bought from, where it was manufactured. Could they track who bought it? Just different... You know, different little groups for basically every piece of evidence that they did. They got well over like 1,500 phone calls. And they followed every single tip that they could possibly follow. There were was even a guy who was arrested for the murders and the attacks and everything. But he... You know, obviously, he was told that, basically, you know, he wasn't the guy. And there was no way, you know, none of the witnesses noticed him that survived. Nothing. So, nobody could officially identify this man. So, they let him go. And, or they didn't charge him with that. Sorry, they didn't let him go. They didn't charge him with those. So, July 8th, 1985, the media got a hold of information about the shoe. So, this was bad. This was very critical information that had not been shared. Sharon? What? Sharon? Aaron! Anyways, had not been shared with the media. And it was one of those sensitive pieces of information that they knew that the killer would just know. And they were just trying to keep that under wraps. And they did not want that out there in the media. So... At the time of the case, you know, the police officers, I can't imagine, like, what they were going through. So, they would go to this bar in Chinatown, and they would hang out there a lot and, you know, de-stress about everything. And they just, they spent a lot of, lot of time there, and it was kind of like a law enforcement hangout. So, it was really the only place that they were able to talk about their life and be in a safe place and people know the same things that they're going through. So, it was just, it was a long, hard day and that was just their hangout spot, basically. So, July 9th, 1985. So, the car that Richard had drew the pentagram on whenever he tried, attempted to attack the person or attempted to attack a victim and he was pulled over for a traffic violation and stopped so that vehicle so 
the divisions in LA, like you could commit a crime and drive and be a and be across five counties. So every jurisdiction was different. So yes, you had like a LA County sheriffs, and then you had like LAPD, and everything was just under different jurisdictions. So a lot of the times, police officers didn't communicate, and it wasn't necessarily anybody's fault. But I'm gonna just let you know the LAPD is about to really piss you off because they really pissed me off. So they, the crime was committed there. And so the car was picked up and it was sent to LAPD to be processed and, you know, to get DNA, fingerprints, and all that. It never happened. Never. And they impounded this car out in the sun. So, when L.A. County Sheriff's Detectives and for the Homicide Bureau finally got to it, there was no DNA. No hair, no skin, no nothing. The sun and the L.A. heat in the summer had burned it up completely. Like, there was no evidence at all. Luckily, excuse me, I'm so sorry. <sighs> Luckily, there was a plastic box in the floorboard of the vehicle a little station wagon that they that was in. So sorry. <clears throat> a little station wagon. There was a plastic box in there that actually had a card in it for a dentist in Chinatown. You probably wonder why I told you about the bar. So the guys were like, okay, like we know this area. So they went to the dentist to investigate, you know, to see if they could get the possible person who brought in this card, you know, see if they could get their name, their address, their phone, any type of information, because this is the dude. They're thinking in their head, this is definitely the guy that we have been looking for. We just need to figure it out a little bit more. So, the they go to the dentist, and they find out that the appointment is actually made for somebody named Richard Minna. He gave a fake address and everything, and the dentist reassured them that if they just basically like staked out the place that they would have him they would basically have him because he had an impacted tooth and he was going to be back because he was going to be in a lot a lot of pain and one thing that sucks about the car the most is five days they missed him by five days so if they had been able to get to that vehicle and the LAPD were not holding it and not letting them have access to it, they could have prevented some of the attacks that happened over the past couple of days if they were just able to have access to that vehicle because they would have seen that appointment card and they would have been able to know that his appointment was for July 3rd. And it just, it was, I knew that that had to be like a slap in the face to them to think that they were so close to being able to catch this guy and they had evidence, hard evidence right there and they weren't able to get to it at all. I mean, I can't I just can't imagine how devastating that probably was to them. So, the LA County um Homicide Bureau, they got an idea together to set up take two of their guys and send them down to Chinatown to this dentist office and basically stake it out and wait for whoever this Richard Minna was guy to come in to the dentist for his tooth. So they're there for a couple of days. Well, the Bureau basically in LA County thinks it is a waste of time and a waste of money. So they eventually they have to pull their guys off and they set up you know, basically like a security alarm that LAPD had set up. You know how they have like the little red buttons under the counters at like a bank or some gas stations, you know, stores, places like that. So they set up one of those. It would be a direct line to LAPD and the police officers would come. Well, the day that they pulled the guys out of there, Gil, one of the main detectives for the Homicide Bureau of LA County, he gets a phone call at 10 p.m. at night from the dentist in Chinatown asking him where his guys were because Richard Minna had came into the office. He was pressing the button and pressing the button and somehow it malfunctioned and the LAPD did not come and basically he got away. 
again. And the description that the um, dentist was able to give matched everybody's description of him. The white or light-skinned Hispanic, the dirty, dingy, black, curly hair, the goat smell, that's why I think he was Satan, the goat smell, the dead look in his eyes, just him being tall, just everything. I mean, like, everything was adding up. And, I mean, like, oh, I just can't imagine. I would I would have been pissed, pissed at LAPD. And I, I just would have, oh. Anyways, so, July 20th, 1985, 68-year-old Max and 66-year-old Layla need, Needling, 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 yeah. Max was amazing. He was down to earth. He was a sweet old grandpa. He loved chocolate. He kept a box of chocolate for his grandchildren and his kids and stuff. And or not his grandchildren, but he kept a box of candy, yeah, for his grandchildren and his kids and stuff. And he would let them have chocolate, you know, no full size candy bars, just everything. And Layla loved sports. She was a very big sports fanatic. She was always watching sports. She was just like, like I said, a big old sports fan. So. They were big, heavy into church, and they did not miss a Sunday. So, if they did, they knew something was wrong. So, that day, her daughter is calling her, and it's Sunday, and she's not answering, and she's not answering. So, obviously, she's worried. I'm so sorry, y'all. I feel like it's so disrespectful. I'm so sorry. But, excuse me. So, she goes to her parents' house, and she realizes that the side gate to the backyard of the pool gate is open. And she's like, mm, no, that's never open. So, what's up? So, she goes and the back door is wide open. She walks directly to the bedroom. And I'm going to get graphic here. So, I just want to give a fair trigger warning. Um, Max and Layla were both laying on the bed. The house was completely ransacked, and so was their bedroom. They were laying in a massive pool of blood. Max, it, Max was almost decapitated completely. Almost. Not fully, but almost. And Layla's face had basically been shot off. And there was definitely a struggle. There, It wasn't like, you know, he just came in and attacked them like the others. He There was act, an actual struggle this time. And there was a different kind of gun used. And it was a uh, 22... The normal... Sorry. Yo, I'm just like... My brain is so much. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Anyways, so... Glendale PD had gotten there. Don't mind me about the caliber thing. So, Glendale PD had got there, and it was the same caliber. It was a twenty-two revolver. And the same morning, the same morning, they get a call to go to the Kenofa. Y'all, I don't want to mispronounce these names. Canovathan residence in um, Sun Valley, California, which is not far away. Two crimes, same night. It's ridiculous. So they walk up to the front porch, and right on the front porch is this Avia shoe print. The same exact one from all the other crimes. And it's like, oh, I can't imagine how, like, frustrating as a police officer and as, like, a detective and an investigator and everything, how, like, frustrating this had to be. Like, I can't imagine. So, they walk into the home, and the back slider door, like, you know how they have those sliding glass doors? That is where he had entered, and there was another print right there in the bedroom, pool of blood. He had stepped in it. The male victim had a gunshot wound straight to the head. It was the same twenty two revolver. And the young boy and the wife were both sexually assaulted. And it it was just really, really sad. He was there for three hours. So, Richard took his time with this crime. He would assault the 
male or assault the little boy, come back, get the mom, just switch back. I'm not going to get too much into it. We just switch back and forth between them. He actually um, ate food, ate a sandwich, made himself at home, got comfy, and this to the police, like, I feel like they were kind of like, all right, he's going to slip up real soon or something because he was getting very, very comfortable with the things that he was doing and he was making himself more comfortable and he was committing crimes back to back to back to back. And I mean, two in the same night, more than once. So obviously homeboy did not care. So there was becoming more, like I said, there was becoming more of a pattern and they were all very similar. And finally, these sketches were released to the public to warn them, give them a little, basically a little gist of what was going, a little sprinkle, if you must, of what was going on um, and who this person was and, you know, giving him a name and stuff. So August 6, 1985... In Northridge, California, Chris and Virginia Peterson were sleeping in bed, and Richard broke into the home, shot Virginia. She uh, lived, got up screaming, which woke up her husband, Chris, who then got shot in the head as well, but it didn't go through, gets up out of bed, bleeding from his head from where he just got shot and chases Richard out of the house. They both lived. Thank God. Like, oh, thank God they both lived. But Richard, I feel like with them releasing the sketch and stuff, it made him switch up his MO a little bit. Well, not really, but his weapon. He actually was using a 22 automatic. This was a new gun. And the bullets were very specific. They were old bullets. Very old time. You stop leaning this way, sorry. They were very old timey bullets. They didn't manufacture them anymore. And the bullets had red primer on the inside of them. Kind of like on the, the casing on the inside. On the actual bullet itself. There was red primer on it. And like I said, they took it to an, like a forensic or a ballistics analysis, and they were able to identify it as a bullet that was no longer made anymore. So they knew that he was reading the paper because, like I said, he started to change his MO a little bit. He, in the Doy case, he was able to call, William Doy was able to call the police and get them there in time to save his wife. So at that point, Richard started to cut the phone lines and radio lines and would use them, the cords for that as um, something to bound his victims with. So, also everyone in the California city, like the state of California, started to buy guns. And I mean, I don't just mean like a little bit of everybody, a lot of everybody. Because at this time, there were six to eight murders and 20 to 25 attacks that had taken place at the time, all in one year. All in like a span of a few months of each other, these had all taken place by Richard. 20 to 25 attacks and six to eight murders. So, KNBC, they gave him the name The Walk-In Killer, and then they gave him the name The Valley Intruder, and then the Herald Examiner paper, they officially gave him the name The Night Stalker, and that is the one that stuck with the media, and that is the one that they ran with. So, August 8, 1985, Gil, one of the, the main detectives that I told you that we were going to talk about, he got a call um, to go to Diamond Bar, which was five minutes away from his house. Five to ten minutes away from his house. So Richard was very, very close to home for him, and he had a family there. Um, his wife and his children ended up leaving and until this case was over. And because they just, you know, it was too close to home for them. So they got there, and... Obviously, it was just a mess. It was, oh God, it was just such a mess. So, Eli Elias Abawath, he was 35 years old, or she was 35 years old. She was a female. She had been sexually assaulted. 
and she had been bound and beaten and she was thank god she was alive but one of the things that he made her do that stuck with her and this is kind of where the satan narrative came from was he made her swear to satan she you know i said i swear to god whenever he asked her not to scream told her not to scream she said i swear to god i won't scream and he said don't swear to god swear to satan so and that was where you know more of the satan worship and that more kind of came along into the story and so he didn't want her to see him to look at him because of the sketches and people were starting to get more of a sense of who this man was and to be kind of on the lookout so this case was just i guess as you could say just added on to the pile of what was going on so at that time in san francisco august 18 1985 on eucalyptus avenue peter pan was shot he was a 66 year old man his wife mrs pan she was raped and shot in the head as well when the police and ambulance got there pulse was very very weak it was a very brutal murder blood everywhere gross just ransacked house it was just disgusting Richard had eaten, ha had left half of an uh, eaten honeydew melon on the counter. He had eaten everything in the fridge as well. And he then threw it up on the kitchen floor. Then went to the living room and then performed fellatio on himself. And I don't think that's the right word actually. No, not fellatio. He performed sexual acts on himself and ejaculated onto the living room floor. When police got there, they said that this was just something that they were, like, just baffled by. Because they had never seen anything like this. You know, this was, this was crazy. And this was 500 miles away from L.A. where he had been originally committing the crime. So... It was kind of like, all right, bro, like, this is, obviously, it's ridiculous in general, the first one, but, like, 500 miles away, so that was even more scary, because it's like, well, now he's just crazy, crazy. He's just out on a rampage. There's no way to possibly track this killer at all, and what he's going to do next, or who his victims are going to be, or anything at all, so, apparently, one of the police officers let it slip to a reporter that was at the crime scene. Gil and um, Frank Salerno, they showed up as the Homicide Bureau detectives for L.A. County because they were connected. There was a pentagram. There was just a lot. There was the same connections. Red primer, 25 automatic. Um, so, it was, they, they, knew who, they knew it was Richard, basically. And they didn't know his name at the time, but they knew it was the Night Stalker at the time anyways. So, they get there, Homicide Bureau does, and investigators, and apparently a police officer let it slip to some of the reporters that were at the home of the crime scene on Eucalyptus Avenue of the Pans. Basically let it slip about the pentagrams and Satan and just a bunch of information that was not made public yet one of the police officers apparently a few houses down that lived there let it slip to like i said to one of the reporters and some of the reporters or one of the main reporters there she approached gill and frank and you know basically was like i have this information and this is what it is and frank denied it completely he was able to put on the best poker face of his life and convince them that this was wrong information, and he didn't know who they were getting their facts from, but they did not need to believe that person whatsoever. So he was able to play it off as being a lie. So at the time, the... Sorry, y'all. <clears throat> like I said, at the time, there was just a lot of media frenzy, and 
the, just the information was so sensitive that it did not need to be let out into the public because there was a way that if Richard found out that the police were on him, he could run. He could dispose of his weapon, switch up MO, just more confusing shit, basically, to mess up the investigation. And so they did not want this to be out to the public at all. So whenever the... um sergeant of the LA task force confronted him about it. San Francisco's department was given all of the info as well that the LA County Department, the Homicide Bureau that they had and so they basically came together to you know talk and decide if they should release this information to the public or not and how much they should release. L.A. County Homicide Bureau did not want it to be released at all because, like I said, they knew it would just mess up or mess up the, you know, investigation. So, the mayor of San Francisco um, had a detective from the San Francisco Department come to her and basically ask her, get offer a reward for any information about who the pan case, who killed him, was there witnesses, was there anything that they could do. So the mayor went to the chief of the San Francisco department and talked to him about what was going on. He told her everything about the shoe, about the pentagram, just information that had not been shared at all and only the killer would know. The mayor of San Francisco then went on live TV with the picture. Just was supposed to say something about the reward. And that was it. And the pan case. She actually aired out every bit of information. The shoe, the guns, the switching of the gun. Just every single bit of information that they had. She leaked all of it to the basically to whole California to anybody that was listening to the TV that night homegirl leaked it and that was just one of the biggest screw ups ever I mean the car the weapons the shoes the knife the guns everything everything wires all of it and it scared people I mean LA freaked out obviously as anybody would so Two of the main investigators, Frank and Gil, they went down to the bar in Chinatown and they begged, you know, their captain to talk to Sheriff Block that was over the L.A. County Sheriff's Department and basically get him to put a block on politicians getting involved with the case. And that's exactly what he did. He went on TV that night and he did exactly that. So August 24th, or, yeah, August 24th, 1985, in Mission Vejo, there was a Sunday morning at 3 a.m., 29-year-old female calls the police saying that her boyfriend had been shot in the head and she was attacked and sexually assaulted. Her boyfriend, Bill, Carn Bill Carnes, was taken to the hospital. It was... It was just a mess. Like, he had broken into these other people's homes and did the same thing again. And while he was attacking the 29-year-old female, she actually says that he admitted to being the Night Stalker. So, the police knew for sure their speculation of him watching the news was 100% at that time. They knew for sure that he was watching the news. There was no way in hell that he wasn't. So, there was, at the time, Richard was riding around in this neighborhood, and there was a witness, a young boy who was outside um, in the garage working on a vehicle, James Romero, and he, you know, noticed the vehicle, and he was able to recognize a partial plate and was able to call the police and let them know what he saw. And the vehicle that they were looking for was, the vehicle that they had was the stolen vehicle that was impounded, that had the evidence and everything. They were trying to figure out whose vehicle it was. Well, this other guy noticed it, called them and was like, hey, I think that's my friend's vehicle. 
that was just recently stolen. So, everything was starting to come, you know, everything was starting to come more and more together. So, oh, sorry, y'all. So, I had to pop my back. Oh, I don't know if y'all heard that. Crunchy. <laughs> so, <clears throat> it is verified that, yes, this is a car. The partial plate matches up with the actual plate of the vehicle, and it is verified. So, like I said, remember they had these call centers and stuff for people to call if they had any information. August 27, 1985, uh, they get a call from a female who... Dad hung out at the Greyhound station and down at Skid Row. If you don't know what Skid Row is, it's a part of California that is known for being very poor, a lot, very high crime rate. Um, just basically known for bad things, which sucks, but it is. And that is the Grey st the Greyhound bus station that her dad hung out at, and her dad had recently made a friend named Ricky from El Paso and so the police were like mm, that that's the one so they go down there they find the dad they talk to him they t the dad tells the police officers that the friend's name is Ricky he is from El Paso and he actually admits to killing an Asian couple so with a 22 pistol and the dad had gotten the pistol and taken it to Tijuana. And they were able to take him to Tijuana to recover the gun and also a boombox that was taken from one of the other crime scenes that Richard Ramirez had been involved in. So, more information started coming in. And a police informant notified that they had gotten a bracelet from his wife's mother as a gift in San Pablo, California, and they went to talk to her, and he believed that it was involved in uh, Richard Ramirez's case. So, he took it to the police. They followed up with it. He went to the mother, and she told them that she got it from one of her boyfriends, and her boyfriend's name was Rick, and he was from El Paso. And, you know, they just... They knew, like, they knew, man. They knew that it was him. And so, at the time, uh, well, not from her boyfriend, sorry. They got, she got it from her boyfriend, um, Armando Rod Rodriguez. So, sorry about that. And he was friends with Rick. And so, they were like, all right, this is the one. So, San Francisco police um, they confront Armando Rodriguez about the situation, and he's obviously putting up a fight. He is trying to get all tough with the detectives and be all bad, Billy Badass, whatever. And finally, one of the police officers uh, rough him up a little bit. And, I mean, they weren't playing no games. I don't blame them. But police brutality against it completely. But... They knew that this man knew who this murder was. 43 cases of, like, death or rape. Sexual assault. Didn't matter. 43 cases. So, I could understand the frustration and, and trying to get it out of this guy. So, finally, the guy breaks and says, Richard Ramirez. His name is Richard Ramirez. So, they knew exactly who it was now. So, they go through the system, and there's about eight Richard Ramirez's. At the time, he, Ricky, wore a black members-only jacket. He wore, had an ACDC hat. Same hair, same bad teeth, same everything. The informant was also able to identify Ricky as well, because they were able to get a mugshot from um, a previous arrest of that he had, that Richard had committed eight months prior. He had a mugshot, and the police informant was able to identify it definitely as being Richard, Ricky as being Richard Ramirez. So, 
We're going to talk a little bit about Richard. I'm not going to get too far into his life because I don't want to give him that much of a spotlight because he's a piece of shit. So, he grew up very, very rough. He had a terrible life. He bounced around from families to families. He had an uncle who shot his wife in front of him whenever he was a young age. His uncle introduced him basically to death and violence and guns. He was in one of the wars and it it had a very dark toll on him and his, you know, uncle was freaking insane. He went to live with some more family members. The situation wasn't any better. His life was just terrible and he didn't do good in school. He had a coke and a heroin addiction. He was literally just like the recipe for disaster. And so at the time, the captain tells the L.A. County um, Homicide Bureau that they had a name. And like I said, eight Richard Ramirez's show up. And so they want to find all of these people. And Richard Ramirez, the one that they were looking for, he had lightweight charges of like petty theft and art, like larceny and stuff like that. <clears throat> and like Grand Theft Auto. Grand Theft Auto. No. Ma no. Whatever. Anyways, so yeah. Stealing cars. So he had been arrested for like, you know, just petty crime. So, like I said, Friday, August 30th, a photo was shown to the eyewitness, and he confirmed that it was a for show, definitely, Richard Ramirez. That night, captain and head of the L.A. and San Francisco Department debated releasing, you know, the arrest photo to the public because they wanted to catch this guy. They didn't want him to flee. And they, they just, like I said, they just knew if they did it that it was going to be him and like I said it was an eight month old photo and they release it Saturday morning um a librarian Glenn Carlson had picked up the phone and called or he had picked up the paper and realized that was Ricky that is Ricky that is Richard Ramirez and that earlier that day or a couple days before Richard had gone into the same library that this librarian was working at, Glenn Creason, not, I said Carlson, Glenn Creason was working at, and he noticed it was him, and I just can't imagine, like, how crazy, that was just, like, a random little bit of information, I can't just imagine how crazy that was, like, he was one of the dudes that were able to help identify him, had the Jack Daniels shirt on, dingy, smelled like a goat, just everything. The description just all matched. So, like I said, cops thought that he would flee in LAPD. Um, their CIS team, they set up kind of like a stakeout at the Greyhound station where Ricky hung out. And that is where they saw him. And August 31st, 19... 85, Richard had went to Arizona on the Greyhound bus to see his brother. He felt bad, didn't want to get his brother involved and with his crimes and everything because he knew that he was being looked for. And I guess Arizona, they didn't really know what was going on or whatever, but I don't know. Maybe, they, maybe he did. I don't know. So he came back, and when Richard got there, he recognized all the police officers at the Greyhound bus station. He went out the back. Through, like through the side alley obviously the police officers saw him they start going after him and he runs across five lanes of traffic in LA in the middle of the day and he just takes off running through this neighborhood and he ends up on basically the wrong side of LA um I don't want to be offensive at all whenever I say this so I'm just gonna say it the way that it was written down on the internet he ended up in a Hispanic Mexican neighborhood and they were, I guess, you know, they were known for like gangs and stuff like that. So it was not a good neighborhood for him to be in, especially if he wasn't known. And so he actually went around the corner to this liquor store and he had no idea that his picture had been released to the public on papers and stuff. And there he was on the front page of the paper and he was noticed right there 
in the ABC store, and he just ran. He tried to carjack one dude. The dude ended up fighting him off. Then he runs again. He tries to carjack this female, and then a neighbor ends up seeing, you know, the carjacking happening, goes over there, and the whole freaking neighborhood just attacks Richard and basically holds him down until the cops get there. The cops arrest him, and Richard is taken to court, or not taken to court, and taken to the police station, and Gil and Frank are called to come get him. Basically, they're like, we got him in custody. So they go and they get him, and the mob outside was just crazy. They L.A. kind of celebrated whenever they knew that this terrible man, the Night Stalker, was finally in custody and was not on their streets terrorizing their families anymore. So at first he didn't want to talk. Then he did start talking, and Frank, you know, or Frank and Gil were talking, and they started introducing themselves, and Frank, you know, was saying who he was. And Frank Salerno had been one of the main detectives on the Hill Stri Hillside Strangler. I'm going to do him as well, but the Hillside Strangler case. And so he was very famous and very well known and richard knew exactly who he was i mean everything about him he studied ted bundy the hillside strangler all of them he was very well educated in murder basically and um so he idolized the hillside strangler especially so what they did to try to make him feel better about himself they sent him Whenever he was put in his jail cell, they put him in the same little cell as the Hillside Strangler. They tried to make him feel cool about himself and to basically try to make him feel confident enough to want to talk and to be like, you know, all right, well, tell them police to come back. You know, I feel like talking. So they wanted to be able to positively identify this man. So they got the survivors and the victims together that were able to come and the... The girl that I told that I didn't feel comfortable, Anastasia, telling her story. This, she, six-year-old girl, comes in there at the time, and she sees Richard. He is made to repeat some of the statements that he made to some people when he was attacking them. And she was able to posit positively identify it as being the same man who attacked her that night. And so were other people as well. And Richard just really played up to the media. Women fell in love with him because they're fucking crazy. Um, sorry for the F-bomb, but it was just insane. Like, I don't understand Manson, groupies, Bundy, groupies, Dahmer. Did he have groupies? I don't know. He might have. Just a lot, a lot. I mean, everybody, all of them. Like, Albert Fish, Gacy, everybody, they all had fans. Like, they're somebody, and I was reading, like, thinking about the psychology of it, and the only reason is because they're famous. Fame. Fame will make people do crazy, crazy things, and get in bed with a murderer is basically one of them. And it doesn't matter as long as you're famous, as that's how it was to a lot of the females back then. I'm not saying all of them, but just to the ones that followed them. That was probably the reason. I'm not going to say it is, but I'm pretty sure that was the reason why. So, because of the impact that the children's cases had on the children and the trauma that they went through, the courts and the police and the judge and everybody decided not to go through with the children's cases, just the murder convictions, the 13 total murders. They just decided to go through with those, which I completely understand why they did that. They wanted to not traumatize those children any more than they already had been. I can't imagine how traumatized they were. And to just put them in the same room as that disgusting piece of shit, I can't imagine what that would have done to them more. You know, like, it would have it would have screwed them up more than they already were. So, they decided to not bring the children into court and everything but he went to court he was not sorry he did not care and the court clips and stuff of him he is just the biggest jerk ever smiling at the girls 
playing it up, the devil, saying that he's from another world and nobody will ever understand. He was like, you cannot possibly understand me because I am not somebody of your world that you can understand. Like, shut the... Mm. Shut up, bro. Nobody cares. He And then he walked off in court and was like, I'll see you in Disneyland. What's that supposed to mean? Conspiracy theory. Hmm. Check that out. Anyways, so on November 7th, he was finally sentenced to San Quentin prison and he was to die in the gas chamber. He sat on sat, sat on death row for 20 years until the piece of shit died of cancer in 2013 and it's like cancer. Hmm. You didn't deserve to die like no. I mean, you didn't deserve to die that way. You deserve to die firing squad. The way that you did that to people that's what happened to you. Which I guess wouldn't make you any better than the other person, but... I don't know. Anyways. So... Like I said, he just had a bunch of groupies. There were people dedicated to him. It was insane. And, yeah, that is the story of Richard Ramirez. He officially... His official death date was on June 7th, 2003. And, like I said, he died of cancer. So... There was a lot. Like I said, there was no way he was going to get out of this. All the evidence. There was 140 witnesses. There was just a lot. So that is the story on the uh, sunny California and Satan, Richard Ramirez. Let's give him a round of applause for the jackass. Not. Anyways, sorry. Eh. Anyways, so I just, I don't agree with, sometimes I don't agree with people sitting on death row. Because there are some people that sit on death row that are innocent and need the chance to get out. But there are some people that have all the evidence in the world to them that I believe they need to sit on death row for a little bit of time. But just kill them. They're not worth the taxes. They're not worth being fed or showered. They're not worth it. Kill them. Like, just get it over with. Save people some money. And save the families knowing that he's breathing the air that they're breathing save that for them. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. But yeah, you guys, that was Richard Ramirez. Crazy ass man that he was. But yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed being here with me today. Like I said, I know that this is on Netflix, but just in case you don't want to watch Netflix, I'm here. So come join the fam. Don't forget to like, comment, share, subscribe, and um, subscribe to my... Subscribe? What? Follow my Instagram and my TikTok. I've been doing a little TikToks and stuff, little makeup transitions. Um, I still don't know a lot about it, so I'm trying to, like, learn, but, yeah. Do you guys like marble cake? I, I'm, I'm looking at some right now that just, I know it's totally random. I love marble cake so much. It's one of my faves. <clears throat> it's basically pound cake, like chocolate. Anyways, but yeah, so I love you guys. Stay safe, please. And just remember to be a good person and to be kind. Reach your hand out to somebody if they need you. Be there for people the way that you would want somebody to be there for you. And always listen to your friends. You know, just listen to the people around you because they care. And yeah, and just know that I care about you too. And that you matter and that your soul is beautiful. I love you, and I'll see you on the next one. Peace, babies.